Okay, hello everyone, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. I am Harvey Miller from The Ohio State University, and I am co-chair of the committee util utilizing advanced environmental health and geospatial data and technologies to inform community investment. I'll be co-chairing this committee in this uh, consensus study along with Eric Tate from the University of Iowa. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off by just going around the members of the committee and asking them to quickly introduce themselves. So um, we'll start with Lauren Bennett. Hi, uh, I'm Lauren Bennett. I am a program manager for spatial analysis and data science at Esri and um, have a background in spatial analysis, spatial data science and geography. Thank you, um, Jay. Hi, I'm uh, Jay Chakraborty from the University of Texas at El Paso. I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and my interests include uh, environmental health, environmental justice, and social vulnerability to hazards and disasters. Also serving as a member of the US EPA Science Advisory Board and the Environmental Justice Science Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Susan. Hello, I'm Susan Annenberg. I'm the Associate Professor and Chair of the Environmental and Occupational Health Department at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health, where I'm also the Director of the GW Climate and Health Institute. And I study air quality and climate change. Hey, Ibrahim. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ibrahim Karai. Um, I'm an Assistant Professor in the Department of Population Health at Hofstra University. I'm also the Director of Health Science. I study the physical and mental health impacts of injuries and disasters on the socially vulnerable populations. Okay, great, and um, Marcos. Hi everyone, my name is Marcos Luna. I'm a professor of geography and sustainability at Salem State University in Salem, Massachusetts. Also the graduate pro, uh, program coordinator for the um, Geoinformation Sciences Program. And I am um, on the Massachusetts State Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, and I work with communities in New England on um, environmental justice issues affecting them. Thank you, uh, Brahmer. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Brahmar Mukherjee. I'm the chair of biostatistics uh, at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. I'm also a professor of epidemiology and global public health and serve as the associate director for quantitative data sciences at the Cancer Center. My interests are in modeling complex environmental exposure data and establishing connections to health outcomes, in particular, cancer and reproductive health. Thank you. Uh, is Monica on the call? She is not, I don't okay. believe. Then Walker. Hello, everyone. Walker Wheeland, research scientist with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, part of the California Environmental Protection Agency. I develop environmental health screening tools and have backgrounds in geographic information systems, environmental justice, and environmental health. Okay, and Eric Tate, I believe, will be joining us later during during this open session. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to introduce the NAS staff who will be helping us coordinate this meeting. Um, there's uh, Samantha Magzino, Anthony DePinto, and O'Shane Orr. And also, uh, Amechi Ukpabi will be uh, producing the webinar. So we have a full agenda today, and here's why, how we'll be proceeding. We'll, we'll first have presentations from the White House Committee on Environmental Quality and our study sponsors, the Bezos Earth Fund. There will be brief time for the committee to ask clarifying questions following each presentation. We'll take a brief 15 minute break from 2.45 to 3 p.m. between the presentations. There will then be a general discussion between the committee and presenters from CEQ and the Earth Fund. And there'll be an opportunity for public comment from those who have registered to speak ahead of time. Members of the public will be called on in the order in which they registered and will each have two minutes to provide their comments. At the end of two minutes, the next commenter will be called. Written comments for the committee are always welcome through the project website, the link of which will be dropped in the chat. <clears throat> and I also wanna mention the following disclaimer. 
Any conclusions or recommendations made by individuals during this event should be considered the opinions of those individuals alone and should not be considered conclusions or recommendations issued by this committee or the National Academies of Science, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Okay, so we'll get started with our first presentation. I want to welcome Natasha DeJarnett. Deputy Director of the Environmental Justice Data and Evaluation at the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and she'll provide an overview of the climate and economic justice screening tool, as well as provide information on the types of recommendations from the committee that would be most useful to her effort. Natasha, please. Uh, thank you so much. Um, appreciative of this opportunity to share on behalf of the environmental justice team at the Council on Environmental Quality. So in late 2022, the tool was launched and you'll be happy to know that that webinar was recorded. So please visit the White House's YouTube page to watch the recording and gain more insights on version one of the CTIP. Next slide, please. So we're pleased to announce the release of version 1.0 of the climate and a an economic justice screening tool, also known as the CJUST. And for some context, CEQ was charged by Executive Order 14008 to create a geospatial mapping tool to help us identify what we call disadvantaged communities. And for your reference, the term disadvantaged communities does not characterize the people in the communities, but it really gets to the disinvestment, the marginalization, and potential overexposure to environmental hazards affecting the lives and well being of these communities. So the goal of the CJUST is to help agencies to identify disadvantaged communities that are geographically defined. And we've been able to create this tool in deep partnership with the U.S. Digital Services, Digital Service. So for the purpose um, of this tool, it was to be a resource for federal agencies to help guide the targeting of resources. So the Justice 40 initiative a priority of this administration directs our agencies to make sure that 40% of the overall benefits of federal investments reach these disadvantaged communities, and this will flow in areas like climate change and transit and workforce development. And so that's really the purpose of this tool, to help our agencies identify these communities, and the CJS serves as a powerful tool for our federal agencies to help guide the targeting of resources. Next slide, please. So we've worked hard to have a very well-informed tool. And so to do so, we solicited much feedback from people with a diversity of areas of, ex, of, of expertise. In total, we had over 3,000 comments, emails, or survey responses. And so um, for those of you that participated, which I am, I'm betting some on the committee did, we thank you for your feedback and hope that you see yourself reflected in version one of the CJS. Next slide, please. So communities are considered disadvantaged if they're in a census tract that meets one or more burden threshold and corresponding economic indicator for at least one of the tools categories or are in the lands of a federally recognized tribe. And these areas um, on the screen come from Executive Order 14008, which focuses on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad and highlight the need for investments in these areas to flow to disadvantaged communities as discussed in the interim Justice 40 guidance. Next slide, please. So communities are considered disadvantaged if they're in census tracts that meet the threshold for at least one of the tools categories of burden. But in addition, communities are also considered disadvantaged if they're on the lands of federally recognized tribes. Next slide, please. So in the next two slides, I'll share with you some of the changes from the beta version to version 1.0 of the CJS. And I realize that by way of introduction, you're immediately hearing about changes, but I think this will provide you with a good overview of what's included in the tool and why. So the tool depicts the lands of federally recognized tribes. And this was a really important change that we heard during consultations that we had with tribal nations. In addition, we work closely with our partners at the Bureau of Indian Affairs at the US Department of the Interior to identify an appropriate data set to show the lands of federally recognized tribes and to show the locations of Alaska native villages. And we're using the land area representation data set of the Bureau of Indian Affairs to represent that data. In addition, there are 10 Alaska Native villages in the tracks that are also considered federally recognized. Also, we have a lot of new data sets in response to feedback, which I'll describe more in the next slide. The burdens are categorized according to areas 
that relates to both the justice 40 areas of investment, as well as how President Biden describes disadvantaged communities in the executive order. I will also note that we've made some changes on how we calculate this low income indicator. So the low income indicator is set at the 65th percentile for all categories that use that indicator, with the exception of workforce development. And for this particular methodology change, we set that at the 50th percentile so that we're capturing low income communities, but capturing those that might have just missed the threshold that was set by the beta version change. Another change pertains to the tracks surrounded by disadvantaged communities. During the public beta period, we received a lot of feedback about communities that are completely surrounded by disadvantaged communities. And now the methodology allows those tracks to be captured in the tool and identified as disadvantaged communities if they're completely surrounded and if they meet an adjusted low income threshold. Um, in addition, there are user interface enhancements. So the tool displays um, demographic information at the census track level. This includes race and ethnicity as well as age and is being provided solely for information purposes. This information is not part of the methodology and is not being used to define disadvantaged communities. Rather, it's in response to public feedback seeking to have that information available. Um, now, there are technical changes that have helped us address missing data. We had hundreds of census tracts in the beta version that were actually just disqualified from being considered as disadvantaged communities because they simply didn't have income information. But now in line with the best statistical practices, we're imputing income from those tracts. Um, during the beta period, we received a lot of feedback about the way in which we had two socioeconomic indicators for most categories, and that was low income and then a higher education non-enrollment indicator. And our goal here was to simply ensure that we're capturing communities that were low income and met at the threshold set by the methodology, but not um, at inadvertently capturing communities that are solely comprised of students that do not report income. So we've now modified the way that we calculate low income by basically removing the student population from that population and then calculating low income. So our example is the community that's surrounding Morehouse College, which wasn't considered a disadvantaged community in the beta version, but is now considered disadvantaged. And so by doing so, we've actually been able to more appropriately affect low or reflect low income communities in the tool. We have added data on U.S. Ter territories, including the U.S. Virgin Islands and Guam. Um, in addition, there are a host of changes that make the tool more user friendly, including geolocation features, plain language explanations, and the better ability to zoom in. So overall, there are a little over 27,000 census tracts that are identified as disadvantaged in version one of the CGIS. Next slide, please. Can you, did it there advance? Okay. <laughs> Yes, it did. Okay. I, think, I, I wondered if it was a little bit frozen on my end. So just want to share with you briefly some of the new data, data sets that have been incorporated into the CGES. Um, we have data sets that are projecting climate risks that are showing flooding and wildfires, um, transportation barriers as well, lack of green space, and then um, also redlining. This has been added to the tool to capture communities that have historic, um, that are communities that are in formerly redlined areas. We've also got data that shows legacy pollution, um, specifically proximity to abandoned landmines, as well as formerly used defense sites. And finally, we have a data set that shows underground storage tanks that may be leaking and thus are able to capture some additional data on water pollution. Next slide, please. So in the tool, burdens are grouped by categories of climate change, energy, transportation, housing, legacy pollution, waste and wastewater, health, workforce development, similar to that of the Justice 40 covered programs. A community is highlighted as disadvantaged in the CGES map if it is in a census tract that is at or above a threshold um, burden for, I'm sorry, at or above the threshold for one or more of the burden indicators, and if that tract is at or above the threshold for an associated, associated socioeconomic burden. So, for example, for climate change, communities are identified as disadvantaged if they're in census tracts that are at or above the 90th percentile for expected building agriculture or population rate loss or projected flooding or wildfire risk and are at or above the 65th percentile for low income. 
um, and I'll, I'll step through energy and, and I'll spare you um, going through exactly what's all on the screen. But for energy, communities are identified as disadvantaged if they're in a census tract that is at or above the 90th percentile for in energy costs or for fine particulate matter in the air and are at or above the 65th percentile for low income. If you go forward to the next slide, please. Um, for all of the indicators except workforce development, um, the socioeconomic indicator is at or above the 65th percentile for low income. But for workforce development, it's a little different. So communities are identified as disadvantaged when it comes to workforce development if they are at or above the 90th percentile for low median income, poverty, or linguistic isolation, or unemployment and if they have fewer than 10% of people ages 25 and older that have a high school education. Um, in addition, a census tract is, if a census tract is completely surrounded by disadvantaged communities or is above the 50th percentile for low income, this community would also be considered disadvantaged or this tract, I should say, would also be considered disadvantaged. Next slide, please. Realizing that we're getting low on time um, for question and answer, uh, but I do want to share with you um, just uh, how we intend for agencies to utilize the CJS. So we're really excited to have recently issued guidance and instructions for federal agencies to use CJS. Um, and as described in the instructions, the federal agencies will use CJS to help identify disadvantaged communities. Um, we have the website set so that you can either use the CJS website uh, directly or you can download the data on disadvantaged communities from the website. But very briefly, just a few things I wanted to point out to you from the recent guidance and in instructions that accompany. So the addendum to the Justice 40 interim guidance directs federal agencies to use best efforts to transition to using the CJS as expeditiously as possible. And we're happy to work with agencies to ensure that this transition occurs smoothly. Uh, CEQ will update the CJS at least annually, and the annual update is expected to coincide with the start of each federal fiscal year. Um, so fiscal year 2024 will begin this October 2023. Um, we look forward to feedback that we'll receive from the National Academies um, and recommendations for future updates to the CJS. So CJS will use a grandfathering approach to avoid any potential problems that occur when a major update to CJS changes the list of disadvantaged communities. So if, it can, if a census tract loses its disadvantaged community status due to an update to CJS, that census check will be grandfathered and prioritized um, as a community for the next three years, as a disadvantaged community for the next two years. I'm sorry, I said that incorrectly. Um, and CJS generally defines disadvantaged communities at the level of census tract, which is the smallest geographic unit for which reliable nationwide data exists to support the CJS methodology. Next slide, please. So um, the, the, the guidance as well as the instructions are available on the CJS website. Um, CEQ is also available to provide, um, to respond to questions that anyone may have. All that information appears here on this slide. Next slide, please. I did, I did advance it. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much. So um, if we have time, we'll have a screening tool demo, but we do have some responses to the questions um, and the task of the committee. So I'll, I'll prioritize that, but if there's time, I'm happy to provide a, a demo afterwards. So you can go to the next slide, please. So in terms of um, the statement of task of the committee, um, and in terms of item number one, there is much information that is published on CJS in the peer reviewed literature, as well as in the gray literature. So targeting indicators um, that are that other tools are using, other tools that are related to CJS um, that are using uh, effectively would be of great interest. Um, for us, items two, three, and four on the statement of task are of greatest interest to CEQ. So we are, 
very interested in what you'll identify among the types of data to consider what environmental health factors um, would enhance our ability to identify disadvantaged communities related to the Justice 40 covered programs like climate change, clean energy, transportation, housing, legacy pollution, water and wastewater training um, and workforce development. Uh, for example, if there are further health and climate indicators that would enhance our ability to identify disadvantaged communities, we'd be greatly interested in that. Um, uh, in terms of challenges, evaluating the data available will be a challenge. Uh, CGES uses data that is na nationally available and at the U.S. Census Tract level. And this helps ensure that we have consistency and availability of information within the tool that captures the entire nation. Um, but this means that there are some data sets that may otherwise be of interest, but may not be available for use in the CGES. Um, when it comes to cumulative impacts, um, for example, uh, we're interested in approaches that consider weighting and additive effects of the methodology um, that supports these. So those are some approaches that, that are of interest to us. Uh, next slide, please. So what CEQ seeks to um, ensure is what CEQ seeks is to ensure that the CGES continues to accurately identify disadvantaged communities. Um, so things that are of interest are relevant data sets that are publicly available, nationally consistent, and available at the census tract level that could be considered for incorporation into the tool. Also, potential improvements to the methodology, one being methodology to better reflect cumulative burdens that communities are facing. Um, another key area of interest is to identify existing data gaps and the potential for future research opportunities. And lastly, CEQ welcomes any other possible strategies that would support updates and further implementation. Um, and the next slide, please. So the biggest challenges related to the feedback um, that we've received re regarding CGES, um, one thing to keep in mind when it comes to that is that this is an iterative tool. Um, we're going to continue to enhance it as much as possible with updates annually to occur. Um, so enhancing it, especially as it pertains to incorporating relevant data sets, and updating the methodology is, is especially pertinent. Um, we acknowledge that one of the concerns is not yet having a cumulative impact indicator. Um, and another concern that, that we've heard is um, when there are census checks that are middle income um, and don't re reach that low income threshold, but are still experiencing some environmental burden, the tool doesn't quite capture that right now. So we welcome your ideas and your recommendations on potential solutions that help address these concerns. And that brings me to the end of the slides. Happy to take any questions. And if there is time for a demo, I'm happy to do so. But you um, are clearly aware of the CGES um, and this, these slides do include the web link um, to visit the CGES website. Hey, thank you so much for that very helpful presentation. That really did uh, help illuminate really what's going on here and what uh, what do you expect from the committee. I'd like now to open it up to questions from the committee. It looks like Jay has his hand up. Jay, please. Yeah, thanks for the excellent presentation. I, I just had a quick question. Uh, uh, regarding you know some of the changes that have been made from the beta version to uh, what are you calling 1.0, I remember that some of the public comments and concerns focused on the uh, non-inclusion of race as an indicator of disadvantage. I was wondering if you thought about addressing that, or if you have any related comments or suggestions. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So yes, in response to. Um, public concerns, uh, data on age and race have been added to the tool, but they're only included as part of the user interface and they're not included um, as part of the methodology for identifying disadvantaged communities. Now, it is, however, very well documented that communities of color suffer disproportionately from environmental um, health burdens um, due to decades of 
underinvestments, um, and they also face greater, greater risk when it comes to climate change. So that is fully acknowledged, um, but the CGES uh, does not include race as an indicator. Um, it uses climate, environmental, and socioeconomic, and other burdens to identify disadvantaged communities. Um, we create a map that reflects the on the ground burdens as it relates to the burdens that, I'm sorry, a map that creates um, um, a picture of the underground burdens that disadvantaged communities face. Um, but we do have this demographic information that is available um, to people immediately when you enter the tool. And it's also available when you download the, da the data through the spreadsheet, but it's not a part of the methodology. But thanks for asking. It, it's an, it's, it, this is an important question. And as uh, the committee assesses um, CGES and looks to some of the um, some of the areas of interest, particularly around cumulative impacts. I appreciate that you've raised this question. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the committee? Kathleen, yes, please. Uh, yes, thanks so much for the presentation. Really interesting and um, good overview. So you has, had specifically said that you view this as a resource for federal agencies. So I just wanted to make clear that that is your target audience here, and you're not envisioning this as something necessarily that would be used by the communities themselves. Or can you just say a little bit more about audience and intended kind of clients in some sense for the tool? Well, thank you very much for this question, Kathleen. Yes, um, the tool is designed for federal agencies to identify disadvantaged communities that will benefit from programs included in the Justice 40 initiative. This tool is publicly available. Um, and so all who are looking to understand disadvantaged communities have access to use it. But the tool is designed um, for the purposes of the Justice 40 initiative and for agencies to use it to identify disadvantaged communities. And can I just add on to that? Um, so Sharmila Murthy yes, and Tasha's, um, which is that, of course, the tool was designed with federal agencies in mind, but a lot of federal agencies are beginning to use this tool in their notices of funding opportunities and other announcements. And for that purpose, they may be asking applicants, whether they're individuals, community groups, states, or others, to actually identify whether or not, to what degree they are targeting disadvantaged communities, whether the benefits of the program will actually reach disadvantaged communities, and thus actually making the tool accessible and having a user interface that was easy to use, easy to navigate, was actually a priority of the design team. Thank you. Uh, Susan? Hi, yes. Thank you so much for this presentation explanation, Tasha. Uh, I have a question about the data sets and the selection process for them that are included. Um, is Could you say a little bit more about how that goes and um, to what extent the idea is to defer to the agencies within each domain, for example, EPA for the environmental data sets? That is a uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Susan. Um, uh, so I have a few folks that are here on the line that were part of the original data gathering for CGES. Um So Sharmila, can we call on you once more? Sure, but um, Susan, I would love for you to clarify your question. What you mean by deferring to the agency? Sure, yeah, I'm uh, happy to. So for example, uh, the data sets that are currently in EJ screen, are you intending to just take those directly or do a whole separate analysis of which data sets are appropriate for a particular indicator? So just to make it more tangible, let's say PM 2.5, um, would you prefer to defer to the uh, EPA and what they use in EJ screen or um, is the world sort of open in terms of which PM 2.5 data set to use in this tool? Well, I see. Okay, so in terms of just think, I think our goal really is to use publicly available data. And so generally using data sets that agencies have collected is was really our first approach. And so if you actually were to go to the screening tool website, 
we have a methodology and data page that actually hyperlinks to all of the data sets. And you'll notice that we pull in from many of EJ screen data sets, for example. Um, and if you're thinking about what's the universe of data sets that this committee might be able to recommend, I think we're open to your ideas. If there are other data sets that, are, that sort of meet our, our basic criteria, which is nationally available, uh, nationally consistent, publicly available, and available at the census track level. And in particular, we have found that there are certain, there are certain data that we would really like, but is only available at the county level or at the water system level or at a geographic resolution that we just can't easily integrate with enough data integrity. Lauren? I think um, related to Susan's question, um, what about how thresholds were chosen? Um, I know that sometimes a uh, federal agency may have a particular threshold that's used for some things, but that may not necessarily be widely agreed upon by, let's say, the environmental justice community or other sorts of communities. So how does how did you navigate figuring out what the thresholds were. Uh, great um, question as well. And I'd, I'd like to pull Sharmila in back on the thresholding as well. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. I mean, I think for the purposes of this, um, of this committee, I think if there are particular indicators that you think we did not hit it correct on the threshold, I think that that is it would be great to hear those suggestions. Um, and you know, as we said, we there was a lot of testing done. We were really trying to assess how did the map look? Were we pulling in communities that we thought we should be pulling in? And ultimately, as you know, it you 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 are drawing the line somewhere. And we tried to draw the line in a way that we thought would really reflect what President Biden was hoping to achieve when he signed Executive Order 14008 and instructed CEQ to, to build a geospatial mapping tool to identify disadvantaged communities. But having said that, if with your expertise, the committee's expertise, you think we ought to draw on the line differently, um, we would love to hear those ideas. Ramar, please. Hello, along those line of data and combination questions. So there are many, many different ways of combining risk scores from different domain. And so how did you decide on how to combine the methodological approach? And typically when you calculate a risk score, we always think about how does it work? What is the goal? How am I evaluating in a validation sample? So for that, what is it that you wanted to achieve if we wanted to validate this score. So the first question is about how do you think about different combination? And the second question is how do you assess it? I think next week we're going to be having a developers panel and I think it would be great to bring some of those, those questions um, to the team. Um, I think in terms of thinking about how I think one of the reasons that we were very excited when the National Academies was interested in developing this committee was because we know that there are various methodologies, whether it's Cal and Virescreen, other state-based tools, um, but that are using different data sets that are available at, for example, the state level. We didn't have the exact same comparative data sets that were available at the national level. And there was a sense that we really wanted to have that, that we would like to be reflecting cumulative burdens in the tool in some way, but that ultimately going with the thresholding approach was allowing us to actually cover an incredibly diverse geographic area. We're trying to develop a tool that would fit for Alaska, that would fit for Puerto Rico, that would fit for the, the island territories, as well as for the middle parts of the U.S. And really thinking about what are the different data sets that are available, not trying to bias one region over another. This is really what led us to develop the thresholding approach. And then of course, the fact that they're clustered into these categories was once again mindful of what President Biden put in Executive Order 14008 and the goal of having this tool be a key part of being able to implement and achieve the goals of the Justice for the Initiative. I think we have time for at least one more question, uh, Walker. 
there. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so, so my question is about um, um, evaluating change. And so I'm, I'm wondering um, if it's of interest to the CGES team or perhaps within the scope of, of looking at change over time for the results of CGES. So for example, measuring uh, increases or de decreases in impact or, or burden. I think this is a very interesting question because um, the the tool is designed for the purposes of the Justice for E initiative, which um, is uh, for for the purposes uh, that we're sorry, I'm getting a little caught up in my words. Bear with me just a moment. Um, for the purposes that. 40% of the benefits of federal investments in the Justice 40 program are reaching these disadvantaged communities. But seeing change over time is also important. Um, one way that we are viewing change um, is through an environmental justice scorecard that will soon be released. Um, so I think that you're, you're asking the right question. And in a, in a, in a in a perfect world and in a future world, we, we would love an opportunity where these two tools would begin to speak to each other, um, the scorecard and CGES. But in the meantime, um, we would definitely be interested in recommendations from the group on being able to evaluate change over time in communities in terms of um, disadvantaged communities. Uh, so I greatly appreciate this question, Walker, and would be very interested in uh, what recommendations the committee might have around that. And Walker, just to clarify, you're talking about progress or, or regress with respect to environmental justice and asking your question or about the, the cumulative impacts over time? I, I think it could be both, Harvey. Uh, so we're thinking about, um, um, you know, whether uh, places are getting better or worse and tying that back to program effectiveness or measuring environmental conditions and whether those are um, uh, getting better or, or worse. So I think the concept of change can be applied to both of those. Okay, thank you. Can I think, oh, please. No, I was just gonna add a piece of this, which is from the agency perspective, having changing lists of communities because of changes over time, also we recognize can, um, you know, it can create programmatic challenges. And for that reason, we thought about the agency guidance, the instructions make clear that there will be at least be a grandfathering approach in place so that as, because changes are important to, to understand from the standpoint of understanding what's actually happening, but at the same time, we have to think about how this might actually be impacting the way in which agencies are implementing their justice voting programs. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time at this point. So thank you for joining us and um, answering the questions and that excellent presentation. I'm sure it'll make our task a, a little bit easier to have that these clarifications. And we will take a break now for um, 15 minutes and then we'll come back at 3 p.m. for another presentation. So I'll uh, see you at three. Okay, welcome back everybody from the break. Um, my name is Eric Tate and I'll be working with uh, Harvey Miller over the duration of the study to co-chair this panel. Um, fortunate enough in our, this next section uh, to welcome Dr. Cecilia Martinez. Uh, Dr. Martinez works with the Bezos Earth Fund and has been involved to see just for quite a while. Um, is Dr. Martinez ready? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. So I think in the in the meantime, we're bringing up your slides, and uh, we'll really. I actually don't have any slides. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, then I will um, turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you for coming. Of course. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with you all, and just completely and thoroughly excited about um, about this committee and its work um, and what it will bring 
um, to the fore in terms of how we implement um, some major initiatives um, in the federal government and beyond. So I thought I would start just a, a bit of context setting. Um, as some of you might know, I was um, uh, in the first year of the Biden administration, the senior director for environmental justice at the Council for Environmental Quality. So um, was in on the first year of the foundational work of how to move both this climate and economic justice screening tool, as well as Justice 40, um, and so that some other environmental justice um, initiatives that were outlined in the executive order, um, getting, getting the foundation set up for that. Um, so I am um, very familiar with the process um, of getting it to a certain point um, and what we might need to um, continue to develop it in the most scientific and methodologically sound way. Um, but now I have switched gears and I am part of the Bezos Earth Fund, um, which is which has um, provided the funding. Um, a good part of the funding for this committee to do its work. And, and I'm just thrilled that we were able to do that and, and our leadership and our team um, at the Bezos for Earth Fund was, was really excited about being able to fund your work um, precisely for the reasons that I outlined earlier. Um, but in this role um, as uh, the sponsor, of the research, um, I just want to be um, very clear um, that you know we we are excited for you to do your work. We in no way have um, any inclination to either guide or uh, 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 help guide what kinds of conclusions or recommendations you might bring. Um, we're just excited that we were able to support um, the top scientific minds that have an interest in building the climate and economic justice screening tool. Um, so, so with that, um, I thought maybe I would just put a little context, both you know from my previous role and now this current role, why this climate and economic justice screening tool is so critically important and what makes it transformative um, and historic in many ways. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard and you know have uh, been briefed on um, why the how the climate economic justice screening tool um, got initiated through executive order 14008, um, which was, um, one of the first executive orders that President Biden issued um, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. And I think it's pretty significant that um, this initiative was embedded in the climate executive order. It speaks to why and how we need to continue to address equity um, in our climate agenda. Um, and I think um, this this obviously points to that to that effort. Um, and so in that executive order, um, I just want to um, sort of paraphrase um, what was in that executive order. And it was that, you know, that we need to turn our disadvantaged communities, those that have been historically marginalized and overburdened, into healthy, thriving communities by taking robust actions to mitigate climate change while also at the same time preparing for the impacts of climate change across rural and urban and tribal areas. Now, um, as part of that executive order, um, agencies were directed to achieve environmental justice as part or make environmental justice as part of their missions by developing programs, policies, and activities to address the disproportionately high and adverse human health, environmental, climate related, and other cumulative impacts on disadvantaged communities. And so towards that end, the administration also initiated the Justice 40 initiative. And the Justice 40 initiative um, had as its goal, has as its goal, that 40% of the overall investment benefits across agencies would flow to disadvantaged communities. So 40% of overall investment benefits flow to disadvantaged communities. 
in the areas of, and this is where it becomes so critically important to think about the transformational nature of the CGEST. Um, in the areas of clean energy and energy efficiency, in the areas of clean transit, in the areas of affordable and sustainable housing, in the areas of training and workforce development, in the areas of remediation and reduction of legacy pollution, and in the area of critical clean water infrastructure. So just as 40 as a goal, 40% of overall benefits in all of those areas towards disadvantaged communities. And so then the climate and economic justice screening tool was also stood up in that executive order because the first question that comes to mind is how do you define what is a disadvantaged community? Um, and, and particularly, how do you define that in the areas that I have just noted? Clean energy, energy efficiency, clean transit, et cetera, et cetera. And so in Executive 14008, the administration stood up the need to have a climate and economic justice screening tool. Now, obviously it's clear that that is a very tall order. Anything transformational is gonna be difficult, um, but it would be the screening tool by which, it would be the instrument by which disadvantaged communities would be defined for the purpose of Justice 40. And it's also clear, as I know you all are the expert, um, experts in this area, it's clear that a tool of this scope and scale has never been developed in this country as of yet. And I'll explain, I'll explain that for a moment. There are models of screening tools, obviously, that have been developed that have, have, are very rich and robust in what they've been able to do. So for example, you know, oftentimes in the environmental justice world, Cal and Biro screen is, is seen as um, the gold standard, uh, particularly at a state level. Um, it was first released in 2013. Um, and as I mentioned, is often seen as one of the premier environmental justice screening tools. Um, we also know that EPA um, began development of its EJ screen back in 2010 um, and it, also has been in over a decade of development and refinement. Um, and as a more traditional screening tool, it served as an initial screening of key environmental issues, which enabled agencies to delve into further investigations into the issues of environmental pollution um, and equity and justice. Well, let me just say that what we have now is a unique opportunity in that the climate and economic justice screening tool has a little bit of a different origin in that it was established by executive order and that it is a tool that will help in the implementation of Justice 40, a massive um, federal investment approach towards addressing remediation, and a whole host of other issues that affect the most vulnerable communities. So from the onset, CGEST has and been a tool that will ultimately result in some sort of resource allocation. It will support agencies in the fulfillment of their Justice 40 programs and policies. Um, and we know also based on executive order that presumably agencies will also be evaluated in a scorecard in terms of how well they are doing in achieving that goal of 40% investment benefits. A second area that is a bit different from previous tools is that because Justice 40 is more than only pollution remediation, as important as that is. And that's why I named all the different issue area buckets in the executive order of energy, transit, et cetera. Um, so this screening tool also needs to encompass what does a disadvantaged community look like 
from the point of view of energy investments, transit investments, housing investments, water infrastructure investments, workforce development and job training investments, climate investments, not only in terms of pollution remediation, which makes this obviously a much more complex methodological um, question than if it was only for a particular issue area. Um, and um, all of this shows that, you know, the CGIS brings a whole new level of scientific and methodological complexity. Um, it has to compare what it means to be disadvantaged with respect to energy and energy efficiency investments, with respect to transit investments, with respect to housing investments, like I said, in addition to the pollution remediation. And so at the Basils Earth Fund, what we knew was that we need to develop the best cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary minds to begin to tackle this very complex methodological issue, but one that has very applied and immediate effects for how the federal government will address its most vulnerable communities in this country. So for example, you know, what is a hazard? What is a climate risk? How do you even begin to compare across communities with very different socioeconomic conditions, with very different climate risks? There's rural areas, there's urban areas, there's coastal areas, there's plains areas, there's mountain areas. There are differences across regions. There's all of these things point to that the comparison of these issue areas across the country is at a scale of complexity much greater than a tool that only has to look at a particular state inter uh, comparison. Um, and what does it mean to be disadvantaged in each of the buckets? What criteria or sets of indicators exist and what data or sets of indicators need to be developed? Um, and then what is the best method to compare these? So for example, I often cite if you are a community in the plains areas of the United States and very rural, your climate risk is gonna be very different than a coastal community. And yet we have to figure out in this country how to compare the climate risks of those two very different regions in a way that will enable us to define where the most vulnerable community is that has a priority for Justice 40 investment. That is a pretty complex problem. And we have to do so in a way that is constitution that will constitutionally pass muster. So as a sponsor of this work, Please know, again, I want to reiterate that we are in no way wanting to interfere with your process and or your conclusions. We're just elated that we were able to support this groundbreaking work. The Bezos Earth Fund has invested already approximately 300 million plus in climate equity and environmental justice, and we're looking to do more. So I think the work that you do on developing this climate and economic justice screening tool recommendations can have an important contribution into the future for how not only government, but also how philanthropy and the private sector invest equitably in, in climate. Um, so with that, I will stop because I believe you wanna have some interaction with the community if I remember correctly. So happy to entertain questions. Thank you so much um, for your presentation. Um, we'll have some time for some general questions in a bit, but I thought we'd start with um, if there's any clarifying questions uh, for Dr. Martinez before we proceed. Uh, 
Harvey has his hands up. Harvey, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you for your com comments. Really appreciate that. Um, I want I like to drill down a little bit into what you mean by the complexity and comparisons, because right now the way the tool looks is that, you know, there are like thresholds and then the community is identified as being, you know, having an environmental justice challenge or not. So I'd like you to, to give us more of your thoughts about what you mean by the complexity of the interactions of these different dimensions and, and how you would like to see comparisons done. Sure. So I think one a, a key question is obviously um, the 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 first suggest had to be based on existing data and existing data sources, right? So what did the federal government already have in place um, that could be utilized into um, the CGES tool? I think a a good question for you all is: Are those uh, appropriate indicators? Are there other appropriate data sets that need to be um, uh, put in there? And are there is there data that needs to be developed that may not be available or accessible at this point? Um, so absolutely, the way the tool works is at a threshold level, 90% or more based on certain socioeconomic indicators, et cetera. The question I think we have to pose is, can we do more? And are there more indicators or data that need to be included to make this a more robust tool into the future? And as I mentioned, you know, initially we began this process knowing that there was gonna be iterations of this tool. I mean, Cal Enviro's Green over a decade of development, EJ Green over a decade of development that there's, this is going to be a process to continue to become a more robust tool as we move forward. If I can follow up really quickly, I guess I'm wondering um, some of these comparisons you want to make. Like you gave an example of like how like a climate justice issue in the Great Plains may be different than let's say Appalachia. I don't know if you said that exactly, but I'm just picking two regions. And some of this has to do with how these different um, environmental justice dimensions interact in, in creating this injustice. So I'm wondering if if, the, if that's something you would like, you imagine being developed in further iterations of this tool. Absolutely. And the only, that's absolutely what I would recommend. And and also just a reminder, the, the, and, and I think that, you know, it depends on how you define environmental justice, but what we've got here is also, when we think about it, the energy, right? The energy investments, the transit investments, the housing investments. So not only are we trying or should we be trying to assess what the environmental risks are for certain communities and how they compare with each other across the country to define their priority. But we also have these added dimensions of what does it mean to be a disadvantaged community in terms of energy investments? And what are the key data or indicators that need to interact with the energy, right? With energy indicators to make that the best possible uh, ind indices for, for Justice 40. Kathleen. Yeah, thank you. So I'm trying to just understand exactly um, how the tool works and what your goals are for it. So one of the questions that I have is, um, if I understand correctly, and maybe I don't, that the way it works based on the thresholds and based on the indicators is you're either in or out in some sense. You either are categorized as being um, underserved or, or disadvantaged or not. Um, and there isn't any gradation in terms of the degree to which that is true. And also, there isn't any idea that you're in or out based on one indicator or you were, you know, you it would it would have been the same even if you had had five indicators that that put you in there. So I just want to make sure if that's in fact correct. And if there's any thought about moving beyond that binary approach that is um, very much, you know, you could have different communities qualifying in some sense that in terms of the magnitude as well as the number of problems they face 
could be quite different. So not not even, I mean, you, you mentioned, for instance, within one category, like what does energy efficiency look like? Okay, in one place versus the other. I understand that's complex, but it's even more complex to think about that across indicators as well as within indicators in terms of this, just the magnitude. So can you just ex expand a little bit on, on what the thought process was there and what the, the sort of hopes or aspirations are? Sure, sure. With the with the caveat, and I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, it, it, I'm in a little bit awkward space in the sense that I no longer represent the federal government or CEQ. So, so I can speak to, I, I, I can't speak to the specifics about what we would, you know, what CEQ would want or, or the administration. I can say that you're absolutely correct in the sense that it is a binary function. It's, you know, whether, whether a, a census tract meets a particular threshold in one of the categories and a socioeconomic, right, um, threshold. So, um, and that, you know, again, that would be my offering to you is what's your best, given your expertise, recommendations on a way to do that better? Or is that your recommendation is, if that's the way it is, given the context of the CGIS tool, that's the best way to do it? Absolutely. Just uh, you know, that would be that would be appropriate. But yes, you're absolutely right that that right now it's and there's, you know, there's a process, if I remember correctly, for making sure to smooth, you know, smooth that over over time so that, for example, one year a community isn't is in and then the very next year it's out because that, you know, that provides some very critical transitional issues that you don't want to have across communities. Um but it is binary at this point. Jay. Hi, I really enjoyed the presentation and thanks for thanks for clarifying a few other issues I was thinking about. But I just wanted to hear a little bit of, in terms of, you know, uh, aligning with uh, what we are, uh, our tasks or the scope of our work and the definitions of the term community, which is you know, very relevant to well, the whole initiative and of course this tool specifically and right now it's operationalized in the form of census tracts and and you know which is which matches some of the tools other tools like you just really use blog groups etc so i was wondering if you have any thoughts or suggestions on you know how we can if we should you know rethink uh, the definition of a community beyond census tracts or beyond census units in general if there has to be more contextually I don't know, relevant or flexible definitions, we should also think about. Thanks. Okay. Um, again, um, I leave I leave the question back to you. I can offer thoughts in terms of what that what you're stating was a critical question that we were addressing um, at that time, in the sense that um, first of all, is the geographic unit the right unit of analysis for this? And if it is, are there other units of analysis that are just as important or critical um, for, for the tool? Um, and the answer was at that time, yes. The, the issue being that for, for data, um, particularly the kind of data that we were, that, that are needed for a screening tool, that's usually at a census tract level, right? Or in, in some way geographically based. And because we know that um, that there does have to be a, ge or we did, we thought there did have to be a geographic component to this, we built that in. But other questions that aren't necessarily geographic in nature, for example, a question that we got from the WEJAC, uh, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council was, well, when it, what, what about when it's not geographically based? So for example, farm workers. Farm workers um, technically could be defined as a disadvantaged community under Justice 40, but it's very difficult to find data around their geographic, <laughs> right? The, uh, that, would, that would show that. And so absolutely there was then this question of what is the right methodology to be able to include those that are non-geographic in nature. Absolutely. Uh, just a, 
a roadmap. Uh, we're going to have public comments a little bit later after um, the committee um, discussion has completed. Uh, Marcos, please continue. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Martinez, you made it real clear that the um, CJS tool is an instrument of the Justice 40 program in terms of implementing it. Um, I wonder to what extent there's interest in the CJS tool being a measure of the progress of that uh, program in the sense of tracking or displaying information about the investments themselves, because right now it shows sort of outcomes on the ground or conditions, but not necessarily the flows of effort to go into it from the federal government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think there's two sources um, of information on that. One is most obviously, I think it would be good to get CEQ's um, perspective on that, whether they would like to have that information, whether that would be useful to them. Um, the other one is, you know, and I'm not sure how this, uh, honestly, I'm not sure because I'm not a FACA um, sort of lawyer. So I don't know how I, the particulars of that, but I know the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council was always look, also looking into, and I think believe they had a working group in terms of the scorecard about what needed to be done in order to um, get that um, to the best possible position. So I think I think connecting with those um, with those two entities would be useful if possible. Um, obviously, if to the extent that the scorecard is going to address how agencies are doing on Justice 40, and a primary instrument of how they are doing is assessing how those communities are doing that are that, that are prioritized by the CGES. Um, I would think that it would be an important, you know, uh, piece of information that you all could delve in. But again, I, you know, I, I that's just my personal opinion. I, So for members of the public, um, encouraged to, if you have any questions, to place them in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, I actually had a question for you, Dr. Martinez. Was there, you know, these eight categories are part of the tools, the tool associated with these Justice 40 dimensions. Was there any relative importance or relative concern with the availability, you know, the ability to measure these different dimensions. Absolutely. I mean, I think we we vetted, you know, and I, again, CEQ can more officially speak to this, but during the time I was there, we vetted hundreds of different data sets and different data ideas about what would be the most appropriate to um, to include. Um, and again, because this tool is, you know, is, is is starting such a significant process. We we're literally starting from ground zero in terms of doing that. Um, so there was various levels of vetting. Did the, you know, did the data, was the data able to measure what it what we needed it to measure? Was it available? How timely was it updated and accessible for, for the tool? Um, all of those questions um, we used to try and assess what the best sort of data sources in there. Um, you know, that process continued after I left, and I'm sure so they have, you know, um, more updated versions of what, how that process continued to unfold. Um, but also, just just by virtue of physical and intellectual capacity in the short period of time, um, I don't think there was any way we could vet every possible data source that was available for right for the CGEST. Um, and so that also, I think, why we pointed to this is going to be a process of constant iteration. We'll get the best possible tool set up and running but as we move forward and as the federal government continues with the expansion of its data and research agenda, there might be additional data that comes to the fore as we move forward that should be included, that is more appropriate, or, you know, that can be added in.
Harvey. Yeah, um, I think I know the answer to this question, but I, I want to ask it anyways. It might might help to discuss this a bit. Um, it strikes me that indicators, you know, for environmental justice are going to vary depending upon geographic context. So what we mean by, let's say, a transportation barrier in an urban area may be different than a rural area. Is is this a complexity that you would like us to look at, or um, do we do you want some like universal indicators that are geographically agnostic, for lack of a better word? Um, again, I, I, uh, uh, I would like you to bring your best expertise to that subject, um, as a sponsor of the, of, of the work, you know, I don't think we want to preclude or preempt your thinking on that. Um, is it? So I would just, I, I, I apologize if I were in a different position, I would definitely give you my, um, my druthers, but I think, you know, as, as, as the funder of this, we, we trust completely, which is why we chose NAS, um, for you to bring the best objective and expertise on that subject. Apologize that I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe we can discuss this later in the more general. Um, I see someone from the CEQ is still here, so. Sure. Yeah, if there's not any other questions specifically for Dr. Martinez, I'd like to open it up um, for both her and our previous speakers. Uh, we had a number of questions that it looks like, you know, um, Dr. Martinez could provide some comments, but also it's maybe um, also uh, best addressed to the folks that are in government right now. Um, so if we had any questions from the committee, um, now's the time. I guess maybe I can repeat my question and ask uh, is it Ms. Murthy, could you could you address that? Uh, you're, you're muted. muted. Sorry, I'm joined, I'm joined two ways, by phone and computer. Uh, the question about data indicators and whether they should be agnostic or geographically specific. I, I, I would agree with what Dr. Martinez um, suggested, which is that, um, you know, one, as you mentioned, one of our priorities has been to have data sets that are publicly available and nationally consistent. But even having said that, there are data sets, for example, that aren't available for the U.S. territories. Um, and so we have those, um, you know, that available on the website. If this committee was to make recommendations around certain data sets and was to suggest a way in which we could still build a tool that was nationally consistent, but that had certain kinds of, you know, was able to sort of thread the needle in the way that you're suggesting, I think we were open to those suggestions. But I think one of the challenges that we have faced is um, trying to look at data sets that really can cover the entire country and the U.S. territories. That is really the gold standard for us. Well, I wasn't thinking in terms of data coverage. I was thinking about how we would define these environmental justice dimensions based on geographic context, independent of whether the data is valuable. That's kind of a, a the next follow-up question from there. But this, what do we mean by environmental justice and say an urban area on the East Coast versus a rural area in the middle of the country versus somewhere in California. And can I just, uh, and I just want to correct a little bit. I know this, because there is this strong approach on environmental justice, but this is actually climate and economic justice screening tool with environmental um, variables as one component. So just to, because we, we did have to constantly sort of um, to the public as well, uh, make sure that folks understood it's, it's not the EJ screening tool, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a different tool for a, a different purpose. Um, but I'll, I'll let Sharmila and, um, hi Sharma, um, answer uh, that question. Yeah, I mean, I would just say um, that the question of defining first, in some ways, I think we put the, we, we prioritize really actually trying to understand what data was available. 
Um, and because obviously having a theoretically good definition, if we don't actually have the data to, to actually meet that standard, then we can't actually have a tool that is achieving the purposes that, that President Biden directed us um, to achieve in Executive Order 14008. I uh, was, uh, I apologize, unable to be here for the beginning of the public session. Um, but I had a question about the public comment process on the beta version of the CGES tool. Uh, were there sets of comments or typologies that didn't make it into the November release? Low hanging fruit, um, complex issues that are of concern? Um, so as you know, yes, during the beta period, we had we had a lot of really great comments that came through, both written comments, we did public consultations, we engaged in tribal consultations, um, and had a very, you know, about 3,000 comments that we actually processed. And I think some of the comments reflect actually what we've talked about today. So we know that we're thinking about the need to ideally have some way of representing cumulative impacts. And I think we think of that in two ways. One is um, the, the question of ranking across uh, different in, di different um, census tracts that those that have one indicator versus five or six or seven indicators of burden. That is something that we receive that we're hoping this committee can help us think through. Then, of course, there, um, as Natasha mentioned earlier, there are communities for whom um, they may suffer numerous environmental and climate burdens but they are above the low income threshold. And those communities were not representing in the tool because of the way the, the socioeconomic indicator actually prevents them from being included. So that's another way in which we're thinking about cumulative impacts. So uh, we also received suggestions for data sets that we just don't have access to. Um, that, for example, like drinking water quality or the location of lead pipes, which might be available in certain geographic settings, but aren't available in a nationally consistent way. And then finally, a question that came up at the very beginning, which is um, we were asked by numerous members of the public to consider adding race into the tool. And that is um, a decision that we did not take. But as we said, we've used other indicators to try and represent the realities on the ground without actually ha including race or, or, or ethnicity in the methodology itself. Do you have any other comments or questions from the committee for our speakers? Okay, so Sam, I don't know if you'd like to um, move to the public session, if we have any comments. Um, I understand if people are pre-registered, they can ask their comments directly. And we have, uh, oops, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, we have two people who have pre-registered to um, make some public comments. Only one, as far as I can tell, has joined us so far, although they aren't scheduled to be making their comments until four o'clock, so we might give that person. But, um, Perhaps we can, um, Amechi, can we bring Amanda Dwelly online or uh, give her access to her microphone so that she can make her public comments? And Hi. while we're trying to get her online, I will just remind everybody um, that, well, I'll call right now. We only have two, one person online, but I'm calling them in the order that they've signed up. They'll have two minutes to provide their comments. Um, at the end of the two minutes, we're going to turn off the microphone. Um, and we'll, if our next speaker has shown up, we'll give the microphone to her. Um, we ask all our commenters to provide respectful comments that are relevant to the statement of task. And if they aren't relevant to the committee's work, we'll go ahead and move on to the next comment. Um, if that other person has shown up, there will be opportunities in future meetings for public comment, um, for spoken comment, I should say, but we do welcome 
uh, written comments from members of the public at any time. And O'Shane is going to drop the link to our website where you can provide that comment. Um, so with that, I will introduce um, the person, um, Amanda Dwelly from, sorry, I'm moving to that part of the agenda, from Beach Hill Research. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm a social science researcher. I worked on New York's definition and have gone deep into the CGES data. Um, I'm going to focus my comments on the income indicator um, since all the other factors are filtered through it. Um, just some thoughts that I'll also write up about sampling non-response and measurement error and self-reported ACS income data. Um, this variable is published with sampling errors, um, which are fairly wide. Um, in a threshold approach, there could be misclassification risk when there's sampling error. Um, non-response bias tied to people's housing stability, whether they get the survey, trust in government, and then the question of um, the reliability of self-reported income, how people really conceptualize their income. And this has come to my attention through a lot of discussions with people in the fishing community who are surprised that they're not on the map um, and, you know, have some questions about you know, how income is captured. Um, zooming out the question of whether the single socioeconomic indicator really captures the full picture of economic and financial resources and capacity in a community. Um, as, as you've kind of noted, areas with similar income could have far different financial resources linked to age, debt, wealth, or gentrification or local cost of living. Um, so I'm so excited that you're talking about data. Um, hope there's opportunity to consider both kind of the really small granular questions and the big questions. Um, I know there's no perfect indicator. Um, so just with income, I wonder if there's ways to pull in income from other non-sampled sources like the IRS or benefits data or possibly create a composite or index um, for income and wealth. Um, if cumulative impacts are possible, um, that could be another way, as I'm sure you're thinking about, to smooth out some of the biases, sampling, and measurement error inherent, inherent in any um, sampled or self-reported data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. And uh, uh, Jingbo Lu, Jingbo Lu, have you joined us yet? Okay, we'll try again to see if she's joined us um, at four o'clock when we actually scheduled this. So with that, I will hand it back over to um, Harvey and um, Eric. Thank you, Amanda. Hey, do we want to address any of the questions and answers or questions we received in the Q&A window? Are, I'm sorry, are you asking me? We certainly can do that <laughs> if, they're, if they're relevant. Um, feel free to do that. Hey, well, um, would you like me to read them out loud or do you want to just go ahead and read them? And I, I can go ahead and read them, just processing okay. <laughs> them a little bit right now. <laughs> um, here's a question about the CGS tool online shows partially disadvantage if the trend census track overlaps tribal areas while there isn't mention of partially disadvantage in any attribute and downloadable data. How should folks who download the data capture partially disadvantaged tracks accurately? I don't know if that's, is that something we should answer at this point? It, it may be an issue we need to address in, 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 our, in our discussions as a committee. I, yeah, I will say that there. Go ahead, Natasha. Go ahead, Sarah Miller. <laughs> I'll start and I'll pass the best time to you, Sarah Miller. Thank you. So, um, yes, it, communities um, may show that when you use the tool online and you indicate the location, um, whether by zip code or whether by address or whether by city name, um, if you have landed in an area that um, has 1% or more tribal land, uh, it may show as partially disadvantaged. One example, I, I would love to do a demo with you right now. 
Um, one example, you can um, go into the tool and you can type in the search Navajo Nation, and you may see some census tracts there that identify as partially disadvantaged. Um, now, to download this information, you go to the download um, window. So you go to um, the methodology um, and data. Under that is your downloads option. You go into the downloads and you download the Excel file. And so there in the Excel file, you'll need to narrow that down to the specific community or city or area of interest. Um, it starts in alphabetical order by county and the census tracts therein. Um, so uh, let's say you go to areas that are in the Navajo Nation. This is going to be a distraction for a moment. I hope that you can hear me over the phone in the background. Um, <laughs> let me mute for one. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that distraction. Um, so if you go to an area, for example, the Navajo Nation, and you see that there are some communities that are partially, partially disadvantaged within the tool, um, there are a number of indicators. Everything that you can see on the website are included um, there in the Excel file. You may want to remove or hide some columns that are not of interest. The demographic data is there, for example, right when you open it. Um, and you'll need to navigate to whether it's true or false uh, that this community is indicated as a disadvantaged community. Um, of course, true would be, uh, or this census tract. So true would, of course, be um, that it is a disadvantaged census tract, while false would indicate that it is not. And I believe it will um, indicate partial as well uh, within that. Um, I, I heard the question, I want to check to verify, but I believe it will um, indicate whether a census tract is also um, partially a disadvantaged community as well on that basis. And uh, sorry for, as I said, the interruption in the background, and then I also know that Sharmila unmuted to share as well. Um, yeah, no, I think uh, Natasha did a, a good job of uh, attempting to explain that. Um, essentially, you need to be just one clarification. So the short answer is yes, you can find this information from the spreadsheet. And I think this comment just indicates that we at CEQ um, should actually work on putting together perhaps some how-tos on how to navigate the spreadsheet. So we will take that back. Um, the spreadsheet itself won't say you'll use the word partial, but you can in fact navigate to the percentages. And I think that this, we could better provide an answer to this question with that, by actually being able to show you the spreadsheet. Um, and that, that is something that, that we will take back. And just to be clear, if you recall at the beginning of our presentation, when Natasha was going through the slides, she talked about two different ways that a community could qualify as being, or a census tract, excuse me, could qualify as being disadvantaged. One was meeting the burden, uh, and the other was being the lands of partially, uh, the, the lands of federally recognized tribes. And so um, there are some census tracts that do not otherwise meet the environmental, social, uh, climate burden, but that do contain the lands of federally recognized tribes. And it's those census tracts that are classified as partially. And this, as I said, if we could screen share, we could very easily show you some examples on the map. I could share my screen if you want to walk me through and if that would be helpful or would that be too difficult? Our wheels are turning. If we have time, um, let's attempt. Okay. Well, let me share my screen because I've already got the tool open here because I just did a quick run to make sure I could do it before I offered. And <laughs> so, and apologies that somehow we did something that isn't allowing us to allowing you to share your screen so i'm in here i already plugged in the navajo nation for example oh, and you, thank you, you so much you wanted to see the excel sp spreadsheet is that what you were interested in um in the search bar would you mind oh actually uh will you click on 
any one of the communities, maybe one of the ones that's not completely shaded. And that's where you'll oh, see okay. a partially gotcha. shaded community. Like right so here? So that one is identified as disadvantaged. Yes, that would be a great one. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I... Yeah, this, this, just one quick note. This census tract, so the wonderful thing about this tool is it's very easy to use. And the census, the side panel here, will change and explain exactly what is happening. So this is a track that is actually, it's not partially disadvantaged. It is disadvantaged to see very clearly, yes, because it's both meeting the underlying, uh, or, or one, one, I shouldn't say underlying, but one method, which is um, the burden threshold and the associated socioeconomic threshold, and um, it's containing the lands of federally recognized tribes. and. The, the two-tone is actually just the two data layers. So the fact that one is shaded a little bit darker than the other is actually mm. not at all um, relevant to whether or not a community is considered disadvantaged. Um, we often use the example of, um, Natasha, if you can't easily find a tract here, I might suggest a different part of the country. Any suggestions? Palm, Palm Springs, uh, California, uh, Agua Caliente. And this is where <laughs> we see um, the Agua Caliente. So if you zoom into one of those tracks, that looks like a checkerboard. Yep, and just click so that we can see the outline of the tract. So this would be an example mm. of a disadvantaged census tract where it very clearly tells you, you'll see that none of the categories of burden are actually shaded in navy blue. So if you actually are meeting the burden threshold, the category will change to be navy blue. None of those are lit up. Instead, the side panel tells us that the lands of federally recognized tribes cover 61% of this particular tract. And so if you were to go, um, and Sam, if you want to go, um, if you go back up <laughs> to methodology and data and the downloads page, Right here. Um, Downloads right yeah, here. Further up. Oh, sorry. You you could go. Um, so we, we don't have to go through the spreadsheet. That that will actually be quite challenging to try to explain how to do this. But if you were to go into the um, into the spreadsheet, um, one of the columns that's all the way over to the right, um, it might be column the downloads link. This is, this is, by the way, the page, just since we're all here, for uh, the rest of the members of the committee, um, that page that Sam was just on would show you um, all of the, the categories of, of, um, of data, where the data, where we got the data from, and on the downloads page, pop open the Excel spreadsheet. Some year. <laughs> yeah. And, Okay. Oh, I thought we were. Oh, let me move it over. It went over on my other screen. There we go. Okay. Okay. And go over to, I believe it's column T. I'm sorry, which column? I believe it's. Did you say T? T. No, that's the true. That is the true false. That is, so this is the column that's identified as disadvantaged. So this is an important column to see. And then you could see the next one, U, percentage of the tract that is disadvantaged by area. So anyway, the, the point is, is that the information is in the spreadsheet. Um, and I, I, we will take back that we should perhaps post a, um, an explanation, better explanation of how to actually navigate the spreadsheet. Okay. Does anybody have any any more questions on this or shall I stop sharing my screen? I'll say one other thing since you're on the web page, um, just so that the committee knows and is available this information. At the top of the screen, um, would you mind clicking on about? 
and then click on about once more. But thank you. So I, we wanted to make sure that the committee also is aware of where the memo and um, the guidance memo and the instructions are located. And you can see that there are two bullets um, that point towards the memo and instructions. There was a question before about the intended use of the tool, intended audience. Um, and that will give some insight um, around the intended use and instructions of use that, that have been issued towards federal agencies. Thank you. Okay. And, and right. since you're on the site, I'll also just say that off of the methodology and data page, not only are there links to all of the data sets that are used, you can also find from the downloads page the technical support document. Mm. Okay. Thank you for this impromptu, impromptu <laughs> demo to the tool. Okay, so here's the methodology. Okay. Yeah, so earlier. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, it looks I, like, I, pardon me, it looks like Marcos has a question. Pardon me. Oh, good. Marcos, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, on the, you might have said this before, and I apologize, but given the partial disadvantage categorization for, I mean, I know it's a very unique situation, but uh, because we had a conversation about the binary classification of communities, about whether they're in or they're out. So partial disadvantage means that they're in, in terms of qualifying as a disadvantaged. So in terms of, you know, these are lands of federally recognized tribes. And so you would often have, I mean, agencies have some, discretion in terms of how they're actually implementing their Justice 40 programs. And so, for example, if you had a program that was targeted to federally recognized tribes, then the point was we were just trying to ensure that all lands of federally recognized tribes would, in fact, be recognized as disadvantaged. In addition, the guidance that was, uh, it was a, in the form of an MMO that was issued by OMB, uh, uh, CEQ, and the Climate Policy Office also makes clear that there are some federally recognized tribes that don't have land. Those tribes would also be considered disadvantaged for the purposes of the Justice 40 initiative, um, regardless, even though they themselves are not shown on the map. And since we're on this, I'll say that if we were, you were to go, for example, Sam, if you were to click the AK in the um, the left hand little margin, see it says 48 AK. Uh, so in, so we have shortcuts to Alaska, Hawaii, and the territory. All of those dots are actually the locations of Alaska Native villages. And the side panels explain exactly why communities are census tracts are identified as disadvantaged. So if I could have a follow up on that point, uh, this is Marcos again. So brought very interesting element of that that I think came up earlier was about uh, disadvantaged communities that are not geographically defined because of by virtue of, like you said, tribes that don't have federally recognized land. So how does that appear show up in this tool or does it show up in this tool in that respect? So the Justice 40 interim guidance, which was issued um, by the White House in July of 2021, makes clear that there are two different ways that communities are considered disadvantaged, one of which is geographically defined communities. And the recent guidance makes clear that the CGES tool is the tool for doing that. But it also makes clear the the guidance from 2021 states the geographically dispersed communities can also be considered uh, disadvantaged, and there are some parameters that agencies can consider, but the idea is that those are not necessarily going to be able to be displayed in a geospatial mapping tool.
Could I follow up on that with just a quick question? D does that mean that the criteria are different, though, for those communities that aren't place based? Because it seems as though the indicators, some of those indicators are very place based. So um, just wondering how they're, if the exact same criteria are being used in both cases or not. So I think that I I, um, I wish I could <laughs> I would screen share this, um, but I'll just say that the um, Justice 40 interim guidance from 2021 states agencies should define community as either a group of individuals living in geographic proximity to one another or a geographically dispersed set of individuals such as migrant uh, workers, uh, where either type of group experiences common conditions. And so the answer is that, yes, there may be a different set of, there, there are uh, a series of variables that agencies are asked to look at. Um, and the new guidance that was just released basically like amends that, oh, the, the 2021 guidance, but only with respect to uh, geographically defined individuals. And so, uh, you know, going back to once again, what's the purpose of the Justice 40 initiative? It is really a asking agencies to ensure that 40% of the overall benefits of investments in climate, clean energy, uh, housing, water uh, are directed to disadvantaged communities. And um, there are really two different ways that we can think about disadvantaged communities. One is through the CGES, and then the other is geographically dispersed individuals. Ibrahim. Okay, so speaking of the um, the spreadsheet that was um, pulled earlier, and going through the variables um, in the spreadsheet, is there a variable that aggregates um, that serves like an index for all the variable variables, a kind of a composite measure that we could tell, uh, or that that could that we could use to kind of compare between census tracts, for example. The spreadsheet itself does not have that aggregating, you know, an aggregating function. There is a threshold count and a category count. And so, you know, in terms of when, when you looked at, when I say category count, that would have been, you know, climate change, clean energy, the big categories. And then there is a count as well of, that you could, you could identify through the spreadsheet of the number of burden thresholds that are actually exceeded. So basically paralleling what you're seeing in the side panel here. Thank you. I had a, a question that um, expands on something Harvey asked Dr. Martinez earlier around, that she made the point that this is not just the EJ tool, this is a climate economic justice screening tool. Um, you know, the economic part is distributed throughout the methodology in terms of these, the secondary burden that needs to be accomplished. The climate is just one of these eight categories. Um, how, how are you feeling about how well integrated this climate idea is in the tool, given it's prominent in its name, in, in the tool and its choice of indicators? I see some of them were new uh, in November for climate. Uh, you know, for I, the climate. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Shavala. So for the climate indicators, um, as you're, you're looking in the tool, just to make sure everybody um, that might not be looking in the tool can see, um, it includes expected building loss rate, expected agriculture loss rate, expected population loss rate, projected flood risk, and projected wildfire risk. Um, so any of those indicators um, at or above the 90th percentile, in addition to low income. So we have a robust set of indicators um, that are assessing climate change. 
but we are very interested to see if the committee identifies additional um, climate indicators that would be useful for understanding um, whether or not a community is disadvantaged and helping to um, ensure that we are capturing those communities um, using this tool. Um, and, and especially if there are climate um, and health indicators. Uh, for example, we would love to see if the committee, community, uh, sorry, the committee has recommendations there as well. And I saw Sharmila unmute. Uh, so Shamila, more to add? No, I think you covered it. Thanks for this question, Ibrahim. Ibrahim, did you have another question or did you just, you forgot to put your hand down? So, sorry, I forgot to answer. Oh, no worries. <laughs> So Sam, you had mentioned that um, we might have one other uh, public question. Yeah, um, let me, um, hold on a second. My, let me move this over to my other screen because it's, my information is being blocked by my sharing my screen. Hold on a second. Um, take down. Are we done with that for now? We can go back to it. We had one other speaker, but there has been no, I haven't seen that this person has logged on, but they might be logged on under a different name. Is Dr. Jingbo Lu logged in? Dr. Jingbo Lu, going once, going twice. <laughs> okay, please, if you're there, we'd love to hear from you and get your public comment, get your comments, please do submit it in writing um, via our public website. Okay, I'll give the floor back <laughs> to you all. Do we have any uh, other lingering questions from the committee for our speakers? Someone actually did suggest a, um, a tract uh, that might be a good example of what you all were talking about. I'm pulling it up right now. I feel like I'm getting to be an expert on using the tool. That's how easy it is to use. Look at this, or at least for the user interface, I can tell you is easy to use because I'm figuring it out right now as we go. But. Oh, except for it saying location not found. <laughs> Never mind. I, I guess I have a question. I'm thinking of what's going on in my state right now. There, um, <clears throat> there was a freight car derailment in East Palestine, as we pronounce it, Ohio, where um, a community has been exposed to um, you know some toxic chemicals that were released. You may have read about this in the in in the in the in the media. I'm just wondering, like. Um, if the, is that a dimension of transportation that would be of concern? This, the you know, the we, we think about road shipments, we think about road traffic, we think about pollution, we think about things like that, but we don't often think about um, freight and and the risk and cost of that, and especially since the uh, less affluent communities are the ones who tend to bear the burden of those type of risks and burdens. So I was just wondering your thoughts on that. I, mean, I, I think that we're open to all of your suggestions. Um, the, you know, the, the goal of the tool is to be capturing environmental burdens, environmental health burdens, climate burdens, um, and really trying to um, ideally ensure that communities that have been long neglected and underinvested in for a very long time actually are identified as disadvantaged and thus prioritized as part of the Justice 40 initiative. And so I think if you have suggestions for data sets that you think would allow us to capture that kind of data, I think we'd be, um, we'd be happy to hear it. And since I'm speaking, let me also just say that I'm just so grateful to all of you for all of the time that you are taking to be part of this committee. Um, I think that we all are committed to this work because we know that, that there's really a vision for uh, a world where everyone is breathing clean air, drinking clean water, 
um, and that trying to actually identify communities that aren't yet being able to realize that dream is something that we hope through the Justice 40 initiative will be able to change. So thank you. I guess perhaps a more general way to state that question is, um, you know, there are things like this incident I'm describing that are more rare, but catastrophic. And I, I guess I see a little bit of that in the current tool with flood risk, but we, we could be thinking more broadly about that. And I guess I'm just wondering if there's any kind of reaction to that, uh, that comment. Yeah, I appreciate this question. So I'll specify within the tool on transportation, it's diesel particulate matter exposure, tra traffic proximity and volume, as well as transportation barriers, which is um, largely a, an economic indicator. And so um, there is opportunity um, for consideration, and we'd be grateful to, to see what um, what additional measures uh, to understand transportation um, and how this may impact this disadvantaged community, uh, the committee may unveil. So um, we we are uh, grateful for, for what you may uncover on this and excited to see the wheels turning uh, on this topic as well as the others that have been raised. Thanks, Harvey. I, I asked that question because I noticed that that town is not uh, currently meets the threshold in, in the current tool. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges that we face trying to create a national tool is simply that there are, um, you know, there are states, we, we have a lot of overlap with existing tools, but it's not perfect. Um, and that we'll hear from communities that say, I'm identified as disadvantaged by, say, my state screening tool, but not by the CJS. And if there is a way that this community, this committee thinks that with sort of data integrity, that there is a way to actually um, thread that needle, because you, you know, one of the challenges is, is having data sets that are only available for certain parts of the country, it presents a challenge when you're trying to build a national tool. Um, so would appreciate your thoughts and thinking on that. Lauren? Lauren, let, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Harry. Hi. Um, I think also it seems that it's it's more than just a data question, right? Because there's also, it's also, you're kind of asking two different questions. Asking, are you disadvantaged in California is different than asking, are you disadvantaged in the United States of America? So there's, there's kind of a, that question of scale isn't just about what data is available, but also about what questions you're asking. And like, depending on the skill you ask the question, you're actually asking a different question. Mm -hmm. um, and so trying, I can imagine navigating that is, is quite the challenge. Um, but I think that, I mean, it's interesting because Harvey, your question, you were talking about the a catastrophic incident, but it made me think about some of the environmental justice things that come up where, where I live, which is actually close to Aguas Calientes. Um, but there's in San Bernardino County, there's a lot of big distribution centers, um, big warehouses moving a lot of Southern, a lot of products. I can get pretty much anything delivered to my house within four hours, which is super convenient, but also has really big implications for things. So it's interesting that that's, it feels related to the freight question because it's things are moving through and you're thinking about transportation in a different way and transit in a different way, but also very different from a catastrophic event. So yeah, I I guess just kind of food for thought while we're thinking about these issues and how they relate to each other. Yeah. It, if I could ask one more question, I think this is kind of a naive question, but I want to ask anyways. Um, there are other environmental justice screening tools you know, we know the EPA one and the CDC one. I'm just wondering if you can imagine a bright future when all these tools are somehow used in conjunction or in some kind of ensemble to to not only identify these communities, but move forward um, more proactively. So we definitely appreciate this question, and um, and and it's. It is a question that we receive uh, 
with frequency as well as think about often. Um, there are a number of environmental justice screening tools across the federal agencies and they serve different purposes. Um, they, they have different areas of focus as it may pertain um, to different agencies. So this is for the purpose of um, that 40% of the benefits of those federal investments for the Justice 40 program reach these disadvantaged communities that CJIS will identify. Um, but there are strengths in these different tools and being able to, um, that, that may have different data um, or different methodologies that may be very useful um, to identifying disadvantaged communities. Um, so we certainly encourage exploration of the other tools and identification within those tools of data sources and methodologies uh, that that may add to um, and further ensure the ability to identify disadvantaged communities. And I saw Sharmila unmute, so I'll pass the baton. Yeah, no, I think <laughs> This is such a great question because, you know, we're, we are just living at such an exciting moment in time where I think we are seeing the ability to be developing these tools. Um, and I think our hope is, as, Nat as Natasha said, is for them to be able to be um, integrated in some way. And I think a nice example is there's a new um, climate mapping for resilience and adaptation tool that has a data layer of CGEST on it. And I think our, our vision is, is that you could have that an agency may have its own tool that might be useful for its own that it's like very specific to it, the agency's mission um and that there could be a data overlay with the CGEST um and that for the purpose of the justice 40 initiative they could be using their own data layer to be perhaps prioritizing among disadvantaged communities Lauren. I had a question about something that struck me when Cecilia was talking um, about the just the the need to keep in mind this idea that we that this tool exists in a way that passes constitutional muster. And I, as someone who does not work in government <laughs> frequently, I'm just curious what that has meant to you as you've built this tool and if there are things that you hit a wall and said actually no we can't touch that because it doesn't it doesn't pass that muster i will just say that i think we've been quite clear that we are trying to build a tool that is reflecting the realities on the ground but that we built the methodology in the way that we that could withstand legal scrutiny um, and so we purposely don't for example have race in the tool um, and that is to ensure the tool's durability but we are using other data sets that we think are capturing the communities that need to be captured Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Walker. Hello. Um, so I saw that the, the tool was was developed um, and, and really a lot of the 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 coding was was out and available on, on this on GitHub. And so um, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about criteria for data inclusion and different types of data. Um, the CEQ's team is interested in. You know, I'm thinking a little bit about a data set that might be of a particular issue in just one region of the country, like Appalachia, or um, or perhaps another data set that um, doesn't have nationwide coverage, but might be of a particular interest to a city, such as um, a great air monitoring network within a city. So is there sort of an interest in considering those kinds of data uh, into the tool? You know, something that may not have nationwide coverage or be perceived as a nationwide issue, but, but 
you know, has very real sort of environmental concerns and, and merit behind it. Well, very much appreciating this question. This is a tough question um, because uh, understanding environmental health means understanding that environmental health is inherently local and that um, certain environmental challenges in certain areas may not be the same uh, in other areas. But at current state, the CGES is a nationwide tool. And so our, the, required, the data that we require to add to or that's currently reflected in CGES and that we're looking to add to the CGES is data that is nationally available. And we want that to be um, at, the, at the smallest reasonable geographic unit that we're able to gather this information across the nation, which is currently at the census track level. I would just add that, you know, you all are experts on this topic and you have a mandate with this committee to be also thinking outside the box. And if there are, uh, you know, in some ways I'm struck by, uh, I think the, in some ways your question relates to the conversation we're having with Harvey and, and Lauren before, in some ways, it's a data question. In some ways, it's a methodology question about, um, you know, is there a way, for example, to be um, piecing together a series of different data sets across the country in a way, but in a way that actually provides integrity to the, to our goal, which is to provide a nationally consistent tool using publicly available data. So we haven't found a way to thread that needle, but maybe you all can. Um, and so I would say that, you know, we have chosen right now to use data sets that we that are available nationally. But if there is some way that you think methodologically we could do this with integrity, I think we're interested in hearing those suggestions um, and we could see what it looks like on the map. But, you know, that 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 is for you all to, to think about. Marcos. Thank you. So it, it sounds like, well, I know that CEQ had considered a lot of comments, as you said earlier, with the previous version or beta version of uh, the tool. And um, I, I wonder if we have access to the comments and or materials where you kind of look seriously at some data sets that you couldn't figure out how to use, but you'd love to, because I might save us some time in terms of beginning with things that were sort of on the list of desirable, but not sure how to go about it. I will say that our technical support document already lists uh, a handful of, of, of data sets that we looked at and didn't yet find it. Um, I think that is a question um, that we can also take back to see if what else we might be able to, to share publicly or share with your committee, which is essentially sharing it publicly. Mm -hmm. Okay, last. Oh, okay, Lauren, here you go. Um, I was just thinking, you know, we, it, I know that it's important that the all of the inputs be publicly available. Were there data sets that were maybe expensive, but that you thought would have been useful? And is there any world in which, you know, there's data that could be purchased and made publicly available that isn't yet or anything that came, came up kind of in that realm that made you think. So I think I, I will say that um, there were certain data, for example, like from the First Street Foundation that goes into our climate indicators that is not automatically publicly available, but they allow you to use it if it's for certain purposes. Um, and in terms of the other part of your question, I think um, we can get back to you. <laughs> My question's kind of related to that. Um, we've been asking you about what kind of recommendations would be useful. Are there recommendations that would not be useful? We'd kind of like to know what the boundaries are of our work here. Maybe you can help us. A great question. We're, we do not want to impose limitations. Um, as Charmla was saying before, we are very interested in you thinking outside the box. Um, Charmla, is there more that you would like to add? 
Uh, no, I, I think we would not, you know, if there, uh, we have made a decision that the tool will not include race as an indicator. And so if there are data sets that have that woven in, that would not be something that we would consider. Um, and um, so I think aside from that, I think we are interested in, in you thinking critically. Um, and some of the questions that, um, that were raised before, you know, are, are things that we've been grappling with, but we are eager for your minds to help us think through and, and solve for. And it's a pretty big playing field for us. Easy job, easy job. <laughs> I think we're just about out of time, I believe. We can oh. uh, we can wrap up at this point. I had one last question. It's a follow up to the sort of the the legal issue around race, what is actually considered by y'all to be a race associated with race, right? So Census Bureau will say um, Native American is a racial category, but yet we do want to, you know, tribal communities is, a, is a, an important aspect of the tool. What about ethnicity? Like what is, what is, what encompasses race here? Well, so, it, I think it's important to realize that federally recognized tribes are actually political entities. Mm -hmm. And so we are not them in the map because they are, they are sovereigns. Um, and so they have a different recognition um, and that the, we don't have race in the tool as Natasha mentioned earlier, we do pass through information from the census that is just available for informational purposes, you know, in the download on the side panel um, and that other data sets that we have chosen to include in version 1.0 were included because we thought that they reflected, uh, for example, economic disinvestment. So we did include uh, a data set from the 1930s from the government's homeowners loan corporation on redlining, because when we put that data set into the CGES, we saw, first of all, there's tremendous overlap already with communities that were already being picked up with the other climate and environmental socioeconomic indicators. But the fact that there wasn't 100% overlap suggested that there was likely some economic disinvestment that we were not accurately capturing because there are peer-reviewed academic studies that show, for example, that if you live in a formerly redlined community, the price of your home is less than it would be had, you, had your community not been redlined. And it was really that economic disinvestment that we were seeking to capture when including a data set like redlining. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, but Harvey is right. We are out of time uh, for this public session. We really thank uh, the uh, y'all came out and, and spoke with our committee and answered questions. This is a really fruitful discussion. Um, Harvey, did you have any other concluding comments before we uh, close out this session? I just want to add to my thanks. This really was very helpful, and I think this gets us off into a good start in, uh, in approaching this, this difficult but very important challenge that you've given to us. And I think Sam's going to walk us out now. Sam? Oh, um, yes. Sorry. I wanted, <laughs> I forgot that that was the way it was going to go. Um, I want to thank everybody for your time, our speakers. That was very informative. Apologies for the, the technical glitches, but hopefully we got through it and um, we'll, we'll try and figure out. We'll do a little postmortem afterwards and try and figure out what we did wrong this time. Um, I just want to remind everyone that any opinions that you heard here are not necessarily the opinions of the committee or recommendations of the committee or of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, but rather the opinions of those that made that spoke them. Um, I again invite the public to provide any written comments to the committee that you would like. Um, using the link that is available in the chat for our public website. If O'Shane, you could add that to the chat. And um, 
And with that committee, please let's um, go ahead and meet again back in using the same link that we used for our closed session before we opened it up. So thank you, CEQ and Bezos. We really appreciate your being here. And I am sure we'll be back at you with a lot more questions after we've had a chance to digest what we're doing. We're looking forward to our open sessions on the 23rd, and we hope that we'll see you all again then. So thank you.